Nintendo disappointed in the same way they always do at their presentation at the time of filming last night, which was about the Nintendo Switch. So, uh, strictly speaking to hardware specifications, as is typical for Nintendo, we really didn't get a whole lot. And I can't say that's too surprising, unfortunately. But they announced some game titles, things like that. They talked about some very basic hardware specifications. We've taken what was shown, what we could find on their website, analyzed it a bit further, and hopefully have uh, a fuller picture as to what the Switch will be capable of. And then we've got a pre-order coming as well for some further content. Before getting to that, this content is brought to you by Thermal Take and their Core P1 TG Mini ITX chassis, which will be available sometime soon in the first half of this year. Link in the description below for more information. Before getting to all the notes from the press conference, just some anecdotal experience with trying to get a Switch. The Nintendo Switch, we're getting one for a full analysis. The plan is to do some hardware capture, do frame rate analysis using some advanced PC hardware, see if they deliver the frame rate they're promising, which is 60 FPS, uh, analyze the frame data, all that stuff, and probably tear into the device at a more, uh, I guess, intrinsic, let's just completely pull it apart and see how that goes. So we'll have all that on camera, probably on launch day. But uh, getting the Switch is not going to be trivial. So if you are dying for one of these, you would, you probably should have already pre-ordered one. I would say, as we always do, wait for reviews and things like that before you actually buy anything, because pre-orders are a great way to get money when you may not have wanted to actually spend it if you had full information. But just to give you an idea of what it's like, the I, I had to go to a physical location to pre-order. It was not really guaranteed available online anywhere. And that location had 19 available, seven of which were reserved for store employees. Uh, so there's not going to be a lot of these things. I have a feeling it's, we're going to be seeing the same headlines we saw with the Wii, which was Wii sold out just for a long time until Nintendo refreshes stock. Uh, so that's certainly, I don't know, I guess kind of a point of concern, but also probably a good thing for Nintendo because it'll look good for them to investors. But let's get into the hardware notes. First thing to get into probably is the main device in the dock. So you've, the device is just a handheld. We've talked about it before. It pulls out of the dock. You can use it effectively as about a tablet-sized handheld gaming device, kind of like a 3DS that's bigger. And that has the two controllers that attach or detach. Everyone pretty much knows that at this point. And if you don't, we have previous coverage that talks about it. The device uses rails to mount the two controllers, the Joy-Con controllers to the side of the Switch and then the switch can mount into a dock. The way it docks is by USB Type-C. So this is not some proprietary special connector on the bottom of the switch. It just uses a straight USB Type-C. Uh, I guess it probably protrudes out of the bottom or has a cover or something like that. We couldn't really see it fully. And it docks down in, which has, uh, I would assume, a male connector USB Type-C in the dock. That dock, I think if you buy it separately, if yours is damaged or something, is selling for something like $90, which is insane. But they're probably they're the only people who are gonna make it so they can get away with it. Uh, so that's what the dock does. It has HDMI out. It has one USB Type-C port used for charging, uh, data transfer, things like that. It has two USB 2.0 ports on the side. And then on the back of the dock, there is another USB port, but it's not specified what generation that is. It does, however, look like USB 3, uh, strictly because the header is blue. But they could color it blue if they wanted to and not actually be USB 3, so there's no guarantee on that. That is what it looks like, though. Uh, so that's the dock. The Joy-Cons, there is an update to those that we didn't have previously. There's a new mode called HD Rumble that Nintendo did a, frankly, horrible job explaining in their presentation. They basically, if uh, I will try and use a clip here and explain it. We can't use too much because Nintendo is, they have problems with YouTube. Uh, but they basically showed a Switch Joy-Con controller next to a glass of water with ice in it and said that if you hold the controller, it feels like there's an ice cube inside of it. And also if there's, sometimes it can feel like there are two ice cubes in it. Uh, so that's what we know of the HD rumble. My takeaway from that is that uh, they're saying that it sounds like there's a positional rumble where if you have a rumble effect f triggered by the game, it can trigger to a certain point in the controller. That's my takeaway. There are ice cubes as a way of saying multiple rumble points in the controller. 
Uh, the water, I'm not sure what that represents. It looks like more weight or something, but, or maybe, I don't know. I, I have no idea, Frank, just to be honest, but I, I think it's multiple rumble points. Uh, motion sensor, there's a motion sensor present, similar to the Wiimote Motion Plus. There is an NFC reader if you use Amiibos. Uh, capture and share button like the PS4. There's an IR motion camera on the bottom right of the Joy-Con, and that can be used for uh, basically input detection, so gesture detection from if you have uh, hand gestures and things like that, it'll pick them up. I'm not sure how that'll be deployed just yet. There is no D-pad. And I, to quote our video editor, Nintendo created it and Nintendo can take it away. So there's no D-pad, they created it on the NES and it is gone on the Switch. SL and SR buttons are available when held sideways that may not be immediately obvious. Let's get into the more interesting stuff though. Uh, I'm going to skip a few sections of this. We'll come back to them. The, the SOC we'll get to, the storage and memory is probably the most immediately, well, the thing that we have the most information for. Nintendo uses the phrase internal memory for their 32 gigabyte base allowance. Those of you who know computer hardware, this is not memory like we know it. It's not RAM. They're just saying it's internal storage. So there's 32 gigabytes of storage internally. It is almost certainly soldered to the board and it is probably some type of, well, it is definitely some type of flash memory. What type of flash memory, hopefully we'll, we'll find out when we tear it to pieces and see if it's MLC or TLC or whatever and see if there's any endurance concerns. Uh, the next point is that this is expandable. You can add SDXC cards. SDXC goes up to two terabytes. That doesn't mean that all of the systems and architectures support two terabytes though, and that the software supports it. So what they support, they don't specify, but I'm hoping we'll be able to internally test at least 128, maybe 256 gigabytes. I am going to try to get larger SD cards on loan and see if we can validate just how large it can support if Nintendo doesn't tell us beforehand, which they probably won't. Uh, the game cards are separate from SD cards. So there are two points where the cards mount into the device. There's a pr proprietary form factor SD card sort of sized card, like a cartridge that mounts on the top of the switch and then normal SD cards connect to the bottom. Pretty straightforward there. Internet connectivity. We are looking at 802.11 AC wireless. That's a good thing. I don't know what their maximum throughput is, but AC wireless can theoretically do something like 1.3 gigabits per second normally. But not all AC devices do that. Some of them are limited to something like 350 megabits per second. It just depends on the device and the limitations of, uh, of the I.O. in the system itself. But that's the plan, 802.11ac. Ethernet support is available when docked, but you have to use a USB to RJ45 adapter similar to the Wii U. I, am, I, I guess I understand why they do it. It's fewer things to put on the box. It is kind of annoying, but you could do it if you wanted to. Uh, eight Switch devices, so eight Nintendo Switches can be connected locally, probably via ad hoc network. They do not specify if it's uh, how the frequencies and interferences may come into play with all of those different controllers and players and Switch devices. I would assume it's an ad hoc wireless network though uh, to create basically a LAN between the eight devices. There is a paid online service. This is important. So the free trial will be from March to fall of 2017. We don't know what it'll cost right now and we also don't know if you will have online internet access without their paid service. I don't know if that's going to provide something extra versus just normal web browsing. The screen. So the screen is a 6.2 inch IPS panel. It is a multi-touch capacitive screen. We know these things for sure. What we don't know for sure is what uh, Eurogamer via Digital Foundry stated earlier, or I guess last year now, December, which was that the screen will have 10 point multi-touch. That has not been confirmed by Nintendo, but there's no reason not to believe it at this point in time. Multi-touch is there though, unlike the Wii U. It will be a 720p screen, so 1280 by 720, and that will display at 60 FPS. It can output to 1080p, so if you connect via HDMI to a TV, you get a 1080p output. That limitation is because of the GPU clock scaling, which we'll talk about in a moment. The, uh, I guess that's really, that's all there is to say about the screen for the most part right now. We'll be intercepting the frames though to see what the FPS actually is and see if they deliver on their promises. 
uh, because consoles do have a long history of not doing that because there's not an easy way to validate in the console itself. But we have capture cards and we have the whole thing set up and ready to go. Um, the SOC, so we know that it will be a custom Tegra SOC. That will be either Pascal or Maxwell. Signs point to Maxwell right now based entirely on Digital Foundry's leaks, I suppose, that they posted in December. Uh, there's, we can't validate that. There's not necessarily a reason to disbelieve it. But they were pointing to a Tegra X1. I'll make some assumptions based on that in a moment. It could still be Pascal, but that does seem unlikely at this time because NVIDIA has not said anything other than their one very ambiguous phrase. Their language left, uh, left a lot of room for interpretation. But their phrasing on the website said something like, NVIDIA's highest end GPU architecture and all of the current GeForce gaming graphics cards, something like that, which I interpreted to mean Pascal when this was posted. But uh, I suppose if you're loose with the interpretation, you could say the 980 Ti is still a leading GeForce graphics card, so maybe they meant Maxwell Gen 2. Regardless, it's a Tegra SoC. Tegra uses unified memory. That There's no reason that would change with the Switch. The GPU and the CPU share the same memory pool. They have direct access via the memory bus. And that is possible through uh, the GPU can explicitly interact with the memory bus. They all share the same everything. It's not like if you're trying to do unified memory with uh, a discrete GPU through the Intel memory bus where you'd have to transact actually instead through PCIe. That's not going to be a problem here. Assuming the Tegra X1, so big assumptions here. Assuming the X1, we know that it's customized, that probably means lower TDP, and that definitely means clock rate tuning. Whether there's anything else in there, like core count tuning, um, there's, no, there's no information right now. It's either going to be 20 nanometer or 16 nanometer TSMC process. 20 is what the X1 uses. TDP on the X1 originally is 15 watts, but probably will be customized on the Switch because the Switch claims two to six hours of battery life, depending on what you're doing, with Breath of the Wild being rated at around three hours. And I'm not really sure if that's great or not yet. We'll have to see. The X1 also uses LPDDR4, so that's low power consumption DDR4 memory on a 64-bit memory bus. Tegra X1 uses four ARM cores. They are Cortex-A57 cores, and those are attached to the Maxwell GPU on the X1, which is a 256-core GPU. Again, this is based on the stock X1, so Nintendo could have changed things with NVIDIA's cooperation. Uh, ARM A57, just for what it's worth, does have a 2-megabyte L2 cache. Adaptive scalable texture compression is also natively supported by the SoC here, the X1. And then, according to Digital Foundry, the GPU will be 768 megahertz when docked. This has been out for a little while now from their leaks. Uh, and that is a reduction from 1 gigahertz on the X1 proper, the one that's used in NVIDIA's Shield device. The portable clock rate is looking like, according to Digital Foundry, something like 307 megahertz. Take that with a grain of salt. There's, that could have changed. If their documents that they've uh, acquired are accurate, it doesn't mean that they were final. Um, so that could change. But the idea is you lose a little over half the clock rate when you are mobile. How do you do this then? Well, the big question is developers will have to code with that in mind. So if they want to program to leverage the entire clock rate when you're docked, that could cause problems when you're portable. The way to compensate for that would generally be a lot of LOD scaling, kind of murdering the graphics output in favor of, uh, of performance on a lower clock rate. That's a lot of work. So we'll see if the developers actually do program for both clock rates or if they end up posting, uh, because they could do this, they could push their games to run at the lower clock rate even when it's docked and you just get worse graphics as a result, but it would work in all circumstances. And that seems at least likely for indie developers or smaller developers where they don't have the manpower to do everything. Uh, the GPU, assuming these clock rates, will be well under one teraflop of compute power, well under it. The base Tiger X1, for reference, one gigahertz with FP16 is about a teraflop of compute power of arithmetic throughput. The uh, FP32 throughput is half. That'd be 512 gigaflops. So making an assumption here, to calculate this, you take clock rate times, and we'll put this on the screen, 
clock rate in gigahertz times two for FP16, times two FMA, uh, and then times core count, and that would give you the through the, the compute power. So with these clock rates, that'd be something like 786 gigaflops, FP16, or around 400 FP32 when docked. And uh, there might be some other considerations there, depending on what NVIDIA has done to tweak it. But that's, that's certainly not the most powerful console on the market. And it's, uh, I guess, for some perspective, it's well under any modern $100 GPU. Now, of course, when you're developing for a console, it's a lot different. There's this NVN API, which is a Nintendo, uh, the one Nintendo is using with NVIDIA, hence NVN. And that might be able to leverage, well, it should really be able to leverage lower level hardware access, which would mean uh, utilizing that power to a more full capacity, whereas PCs generally don't. So that is something to keep in mind. Battery life, again, two to six hours. Zelda lasts about three hours on one charge. You can power it via USB Type-C, including battery banks, most likely. That is certainly relevant. And I think we got all of this other than the games. Uh, so launch titles include, well, relevant launch titles include Zelda, Breath of the Wild, 1-2 Switch, Super Bomberman R, for some reason Bomberman has returned, and then March you can expect uh, Fast RMX, Snipper Clips, whatever that is, Has Been Heroes, and uh, heading into April there's Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, and everything else comes after that with a few titles that are not specified like Minecraft. So. A decent amount of games. We don't know if Skyrim is the HD version or not. But that's what we're looking at right now for the Switch. We will have minimally a hardware teardown. Might look into a console review with the games that we've pre-ordered. Not promised, but that might happen. If it does, certainly stay tuned and just maybe hold off on your purchases for at least one of those content pieces because that will probably help you make decisions. We'll be on the lookout for lag and things like that and make sure they're delivering the frame rates that are promised. So. Uh, check back for that. Subscribe for more. As always, links in the description below for more information. Patreon link in the post all video. Thank you for watching. I'll see you all next time.